the head of a man. Then, among the final years of the horse, cannon are horse-drawn along the river into position at the edge of June. The day is hot, the capitals are abroad. So azimuths are set, trajectories approximated, an 18-pounder bombards the four courts and its garrison. Public records reign over the living. What this thing is, is too massive to reign. Pleadings made to the law exchequer, 1773. A few fragments whose outer edges are ash forever, whose centre has been fused into new species of vellum and ink. Where intimate skin wizened in the heat, denatured to flame-dark carbon, gnarled bark, here emerges the gurn of a man's face, a double pout of parchment rolled and pursed, a severe pointed nose, the papery wasp's nest complexion of the mummified, a distended and eyeless head still stunned by the shock of its disturbance, a cheek tattooed with all that remains legible from the quill of the king's remembrancer. What occupies his thoughts is gone for good. The ordinary, tedious disputes landlord and tenant farmer brought before nodding justices and their magistrates, libel and taxes, the proper keeping of geese, or the right to drive one's cattle, the nearly inconsequential legends by which names outlive their custodians. Even Noah, the world's first archivist, drunk on the wine of the greenest vineyards, must have wept in his tent some afternoons for every neighbour he had forsaken. The people tending to their earthly sins who saw but didn't recognise history vanishing into the flood on cubits of gopher wood and faith bleeding and strong. Is it the ark and all that survived it that constitutes our civilization, or the sailed away from collateral innumerable under the water? After the ark, the first thing Noah did was make an altar and burnt offerings. Animals unknowable to language, some unique beasts of whom there were once two. Um, it's, a little, um, it's a little challenging, I think, to go into the archive which has many, many sites so I visited. For example, Promi um, in Belfast, the Public Records Office, um, not knowing what I'm looking for. I mean, I'm looking for something. Um, but ordinarily, the way that um, I write things, or the way that many people compose things, I think, um, is by not knowing, um, is, is waiting for something that will catch your attention. So I spent a couple of days in Promi, wandering through the past, looking at lots of letters, lots of strange uh, collections of newspaper clippings, letters um, you know, concerned sons had sent to their mothers back home, you know, sons in America saying, what's going on there? I heard this on the news, um, or the equivalent of the news in the 1920s. Um, what's going on? Um, but none of that really got me, none of that really, really helped. Um, and one of the challenges is that language although it's interesting, doesn't really provoke imagination so well. So um, one night, uh, looking online, I suppose, um, I was looking at photographs, which often I found very, very interesting, and found this one. Um, so it's a photograph of um, a text called Pleadings Made to the Law Exchequer, 1773, uh, that was damaged um, when the four courts were, were bombed. Um, an explosion took place there, anyway. Um, and it's this very ugly kind of object, and it's a book that's been so severely damaged that it's been melted and fused um, and burned and charred um, into a contorted shape, a very ugly contorted shape. Um, and yeah, looking at it, it seemed to me that I saw a man's face in it, a very strange um, face. Um, so it is this curious materiality of a book, in other words, a kind of historical record, um, being burned into the shape of a person, um, and that's kind of my sparking point, you know, what... what um, how do I get beyond the kind of a certain coldness that the archive after Boston has um, of objects um, disconnected uh, from people? Um, here, I guess, my imagination made this object into a person, um, and that was a place to start from to think, well, what uh, if indeed this is a person? Uh, what does it represent? What, did, what does it know? What does it remember? Um, what does it mean that you know entire sections um, of the country lost their heritage and their past and their family records um, in that explosion? What does it mean to lose all of that? Um, who is this person uh, who's kind of burned to be on the speech? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting what you're saying about like waiting for something in the archive to take your imagination, and uh, and you know, it is a we'll talk a little bit later about a, a kind of how strange of a kind of a place to work that for poets the archive can be. Um, but I did see the photograph that you're talking about, and it is a, a kind of an oddly grotesque kind of looking object when you see it now because it's so kind of uh, disfigured, I suppose. Um, and I suppose thinking about imagination and the, the places that your mind kind of goes when you're in the archive, when you're writing the poem, um, to me the poem really seems to reach outwards and I see that through the various references that, that are right in the poem. You know, we've got historical references, biblical, archival, legal references as a reference to Yates, for example. And I really love the line about Noah as the first archivist. I kind of went back and looked at that several times when I read it. Um, so, yeah, can you maybe just talk a little bit about those references and their place in the poem? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I suppose it's, it's hard to read, again, to work out exactly where this comes from or in what sequence mm -hmm. things, things kind of come in. Um, but yes, there are these various um, kind of references in it um, to various things. I didn't do them because I'm the sort of person who wants you to know that I read something that's not very interesting to me. That seems like a kind of dreadful way to approach things. Um, but uh, yeah, there is this sense, I mean, I think one of the first things that I kind of make a reference to is, is in the, the fourth line, the day is half the cattles are abroad. Um, I just love Romeo and Juliet. I know that's not really all that obvious, but that's a line from, from Romeo and Juliet. Um, it's, it's before the, the brawling really gets going, um, I guess, in the, in the second or third act. But I mean, one of the phrases that's used so often throughout um, that play is, uh, three civil roles, the idea of this, this sort of a, a kind of civil war that's happening. Now, I'm not proud of that, but I, you know, I was probably missing a line and to put something in. Um, maybe that's what it was. Um, but yeah, so there's these various things that are happening, and I, I think I would also say maybe that uh, I'm particularly grateful that a copy of this poem is with you, because I mean, to me, this is quite difficult as a poem, um, in, by which I mean it's they're long sentences, the language is quite dense. I mean, what I'm trying to do, I suppose, is capture this feeling of a gnarled object. This, this thing is being forced out of shape. Um, forgive me, my microphone's uh, slipping. But, uh, am I all right? I'm audible? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but yes, trying to get this, trying to, trying to make the language feel like that. So yes, I have uh, then these kind of legal languages, uh, and then this sense of, yeah, well, what is in this book? This, uh, this sense of cleaning is going to the large checker. Um, it's probably boring. Uh, language is the complaints of the, the 18th century, it's, it's not very, very interesting stuff. Um, and then we have yet yeah, a little bit of um, Yeats that shows in. But where Noah comes from, um, I don't know. And I find it very interesting, and I, I've been trying to think about where that comes from. Um, my first instinct is to think that it's probably a pun on Ark and Archivist. Um, and they're not connected, because I looked it up. I hope that they would be different words. Um, they don't hey, belong to each other. I know it's really supportive, <laughs> isn't it? Um, but there you are, persisted. Um, but I was thinking, yeah, what is, what is this act of archiving? Um, what, is the, uh, what is the force that makes archiving necessary, to some extent? In our, I guess in our present day, um, we're worried very much about obsolescence. We're worried about things, that things will just go away, that we will lose things. Um, that we have so much, and some, you know, some of it must be lost. Um, in the case of these archives, these archival materials, they were yet rescued because they were going to be destroyed forever. Um, in the case of Noah, it was, I guess, an order slightly bigger than that. I mean, the, the world was going. Um, so this idea, yeah, of Noah being an archivist, um, of trying to think of what this role of the archive is um, to rescue, to preserve, um, on whose orders, on whose ideals, um, I mean, to some extent the archive is to lose things and to exclude things as much as it is to include things. Um, and that's perhaps, I imagine, a very difficult decision to make. Um, so all of these things that are trying to um, work together, to think of various things, to think about legal texts as this is, um, and to think about the act of archiving um, in terms of what is uh, abandoned, what is lost, uh, what is destroyed beyond recollection. Um, when I look at it, uh, I'm now trying to work out where it comes from, I notice, um, yeah, the rain starts in line 8, public records meaning over the Liffey. I imagine that's the same rain that starts at the start of this poem that ends up, you know, posing a problem for Noah a bit later on. Um, I don't know. Uh, but I'm not sure where that, that comes from, uh, except thinking this very grand scale of, uh, of what is lost um, outside of the archive. Yeah, I think that's something that, you know, everyone I've talked to about going into the archive and doing this kind of work has has different kind of perspective on, on what is there and what is not there. And, of course, like, the 
there's so many things at play in that, like, you know, there's motivations of institutions, there's professional archivists, there's, you know, there's so many decisions that are made in terms of what is, what is kept and what is accessible and what is seen. And I guess part of the work that we've all been doing is to take out the parts that are, you know, they're meaningful to us in some way and kind of bring light to them again. So it's interesting and, you know, it's interesting just to kind of think about time in this way and, and in kind of preparing for this conversation I read a statement that you wrote about the poem and you're discussing time and the dices of the archive and what you call its nowness. And I'd really like to hear more about that and Maria talked as well about you know the present and future and so you've got all these kind of um, forms of time kind of clashing against each other in the archive and in, in writing, in kind of writing the archive in the way that we are. Um, so I'm curious to hear more about how you thought about time in the poem and whether you think the kind of now of the poem when you were drafting it or in its early stages is kind of different to this present moment of now when maybe we hear you read it tonight or when it's on the page, like how does that now shift for you? Yeah, it's something, I mean, it's, yeah, I think Maria said something that I, that I so articulately, which I agree with in a, in a massive sense. Um, I'm not totally capable of making any any huge uh, statements about it, I suppose. But what I'm aware of is, uh, yeah, what might be healthy or useful for society is is realizing that you're you know you're not at the end of the past. <coughs> you're, you're you're writing that bit in the middle um, between the past happening and the, and the future. Um, Maria said it as as well as anybody could, I think. Um, but I was very aware of that that I was going into the archive um, at a very particular time. Uh, for a very particular purpose. Um, I was going in um, approximately 100 years after something happened. Um, the, you know, something happened over the course of the Civil War um, to find something interesting to me. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in what I would have found if that wasn't my brief, so to speak, if I, if I wasn't looking for something to say about the Civil War, if I wasn't looking for an object, what I might have found in that uh, archive and uh, the various archives I visited. Um, but it is true that we, any time we enter somewhere, we write during it at that moment, and certain things will correlate with us in certain ways. Um, I'm not sure who it was. Um, someone like Mark Twain or something that said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Um, and there's that sense of, you know, what, am I, what is going to present itself to me uh, in the archive uh, at any given time? Um, so I can't think of myself outside of the particular moment that I was accessing the archive. But I think it's fair to say that we're also always, certainly in these creative acts, we're always um, approaching it you know, in the moment that we're in it. Um, the, the strange sense, I suppose, that I've been thinking of throughout this, this sort of period of uh, centenaries and commemorations or memorials or memorializations, or even working on what the word is, um, I suppose, um, is, is, yeah, the sort of small narratives that, that don't get through a lot of the time, a lot of the things that, that get missed. Um, but yeah, thinking of the sense that um, I mean, we're always in a commemoration of something. We're all always in its rhyme. Um, if Mark Twain did say that, um, and it just so happens that this particular moment, that particular now, um, if that even makes sense to say that now rather than yeah. this now, um, but that that moment, uh, the things that presented themselves uh, to me were were because of that moment. Um, and were I to look at the same archive again, I would see something different. Uh, I'm certain, uh, in the same way that you, know, you look at a family photograph. A year after it's been taken, you look at, you look at it ten years after it's been taken, you look uh, at it after someone in it has passed away. Something's changed. The, the fact of the object has not changed in any way, but you would swear something's changed. Um, so I think being aware of the, the context, um, really, um, you know, thinking of now as, as context um, more than anything else, um, I find it interesting. Yeah, I think especially, you know, because when you're writing a poem, you are committing to a certain moment of now because you're putting it on the page, like in that moment, and that does change and your own kind of relationship to the poem can change as it, as you hear it or as it gets published or as it maybe is presented in different contexts. So the now is really like a, a shifting thing and something I find kind of tricky with poetry is that kind of committing to this moment of, of now and it's published and it is the thing, you know, and then maybe later it's a different thing or you think of it differently. Um, I'd really like to talk about the form of the poem because I'm really always very interested in form and also because we all have the poem in front of us, it's a nice uh, conversation to have. And 
So I've seen this on the page tonight, but I've also seen it on the website where it looks slightly different. Um, so I'm, I was really taken by seeing it on the page tonight with the two um, sides, um, which really made sense then when you were talking about the density of that kind of um, destroyed document, and I, it kind of made me look at it in a totally different way. Um, when I'd seen it on a web page, it was kind of um, split by an asterisk. So I had a feeling that there was kind of two parts to the poem. And we're also looking at, you know, a very kind of um, organized poem in terms of these quatrains. Um, you know, it's kind of mirrored on the page. The quatrains are offering in jam. So I'm really curious about particularly that shift between, you know, the, the one side of the poem to the next. Um, and just in general, how you thought about putting this on the page? Well, I'll be as um, honest as I can be. I mean, I mean, I think part of it is that there's something, I don't know if you agree with those you write poems, might, might agree or might not, but there's something very, very proper about the, the four-line verse, mm. the four-line stanza. It just seems proper. Um, <laughs> and I suppose, that, you know, when, I, when I'm thinking, uh, you know, am I going to offer a kind of uh, poem that it's not necessarily fulfilling a purpose, but it's answering answering a, a very generous request. Um, I, I, I want to give it. I want it to certainly appear to have integrity. I want it to feel kind of solid. Um, that's probably one instinct uh, that I have. Um, but I think there's perhaps the the idea of. Um, I mean, the, the, one of the problems of all art is tension and. and uh, Disorder um, and you know um, order and disorder and those sorts of things, um, and I think there's something very very plain um, it seems about the shape of, of a poem like this. Um, but the sentences are going all over the place. The sentences are very long at times. Um, there's one towards the end of that first part that goes on for probably far too long. Um, we're intimate skin wizened in the heat. I mean that goes on for um, you know another nine lines after. That's a very dense kind of uh, feeling. Um, but what happens with that little asterisk? So there is one um, after after that very very long sentence um, from the quill of the king's remembrance. Here, um, it's very dense. There's a little asterisk that uh, separates these two parts. And I think what happens uh, between these, these two parts is uh, is that's that's definitely where the poem starts to speculate. Um, so the, the description, I guess, in this first part um, is is really a description of an object. It doesn't speculate too much. It says things that are you know relatively true, um, that this is what happened to the four horts, and then we have a description of this object, and um, really, you know, here emerges the goat of a man's face, I guess, and um, is, uh, is the bit where I claim something has happened. But then after this, it turns inwards, you know, it tries to go into this document, it tries to read what can't be seen in this, this burned, charred object, and um, what occupies his thoughts has gone for good. Um, so this, this turn between these two parts goes from looking at this object um, as if one saw it in a, a museum um, or, or an archive or something. Um, and then the sort of definite poetic moment steps in and we start speculating. We try to read what can't be read um, on the inside of this book. Um, so the purpose of the, the asterisk is that is to, is to balance this turn uh, from the external object to try and go into it um, and imagine what's inside. Mm, yeah, it it's looks so good on stage. I, I really enjoy seeing it. Um, so I've been kind of having these conversations um, with poets um, in, um, on the podcast for the National Library and also for Poetry as Commemoration at the Museum of Literature Ireland. Um, so I've been talking a lot to poets who are working in the archive or working on this specific commission. Um, and the last people I spoke to were uh, Chiamaka and Iamati and Bibi Ashley. And we had a great conversation and kind of one of the things that emerged is thinking about these archival poems as kind of pressure poems, really because of the nature of these commissions and the constraints of working in the archive. You know, the archive is this really controlled space where, you know, you can't bring in water and you can only bring in a pencil and, you know, oftentimes there's no windows or there's not great light and it's just, it's a very um, particular atmosphere, especially um, for writing poetry. I mean, it's not the way I usually would write a poem, although I've become quite good at it now. <laughs> but I was wondering, um, you know, what your experience was writing the poem and whether you kind of relate it all to this kind of characterization of the kind of pressure poem from the archive. I, mean, I think it is, yeah, I mean, it is challenging because to, to some extent you would never, chances are you might not choose um, to write something like this. So you're, you're allowing yourself to be moved out of a comfort zone uh, where yeah, you have to write on point. Thankfully, um, the, the brief was, was wide. I mean, it was respond to something in the archive. Um, 
that also has its problems because there's quite a lot in the archive. Uh, where do you where do you narrow this down? So you're you're looking for something. Um, but I think there is. Uh, I mean, the thing that I find quite interesting about it, um, uh, which provides a different kind of pressure, I think, um, is just how do you respond to something like that? How do you respond to the civil war or, or the, the matters of it? How do you do that um, in a way that is uh, fair and balanced um, and respectful to the real people who are involved in this? I mean, that's not that long ago. Um, it's, a, it's 100 years ago. Um, I guess as we heard from Angela, this is extremely close. I mean, we're not a long way away from this. Um, so, what sort of things do you choose? Am I going to am I going to pick um, you know a personal object of a complete stranger and write about it? That was not appealing to me. Um, there's a coldness to this object. I mean, it's 1773. It's already pretty ancient by the time we're getting um, to 1916 um, and getting a bit later on. Um, it's already this um, old, no offence, probably quite tedious text. Um, so my my feeling is that I was drawn to something like that to try and stay away from the ethical problems of, of real life um, and real people's lives. Um, so that's, that's one problem. Um, but there's also the, I guess, what do we say about, uh, I mean, the other anniversaries that, I mean, part of this decade um, is partition and, and thinking about all of that. I mean, what does one say as a, you know, practitioner or writer or whatever? You sort of can't not acknowledge that that's a part of this. This isn't, you know, this isn't cold history. This is, uh, it isn't for anyone, uh, but for many people, it's a very big, essential uh, moment in their lives, their personal history, their sense of their state, their sense of uh, their identity, national identity, everything. And um, how does one go about um, acknowledging that in some way? Um, and I suppose that's where an idea like, you know, Noah, for some strange reason, comes in. Um, there were people, you know, for, for that narrative to work, people had to be left behind, even if they were sinful people in the old days of the Old Testament. Um, but that's the story of the virtuous being saved and um, other people being left behind. Um, is, it, is that enough to um, acknowledge that very complicated relationship that we have uh, with the past and the tradition and all that? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I feel like the Angel is giving me all the things that I have without directly answering your question. But this, is, uh, great. this is as far as I can manage. You're doing a great job. <laughs> I know, I think you're right. There's, um, there's a real closeness working in the decade of centenaries um, because 100 years is not that long. And, you know, for example, my grandmother was born in 1921, so, you know, that that's not very far removed for me, and I think myself, Chiamaka and Bibi talked about this as well, just about that kind of closeness to the past, and that past being, coming back to time and conversations about time, that past being part of the present, and, you know, where you kind of draw those lines and how you enter that as, as a poet. And, and we're, you know, um, you know, kind of working alongside this kind of big um, historic project, that is, you know, connected to the state and, and all of those kind of complications. Um, and I suppose one of the things that Chiamaka was really interested in, you know, she was um, interested in the women of the revolution and we talked a lot about that. And she was interested in this idea of who is useful in a revolution. And it kind of got me thinking to, you know, what is useful in, in commemoration? And just from what you're kind of saying there, I'm wondering about, you know, and this is a big question, but whether, you know, poetry is useful in commemoration or how you see, you know, kind of your role in in this kind of project of commemoration. Yeah, is it, is it useful? I mean, yes, it is. I mean, I think it is um, important. Um, it's, it's interesting what it, yeah, what this sort of, a, what this kind of poem does. Um, it absolutely does have a, a function. Um, I think the risk, and this is true of all kinds of poetry, I think, um, is it's perfectly possible to be political but with a small p rather than with a big p. Um, I think the responsibility, probably in this specific circumstance, is to really consider the narrative as we understand it. And I guess what Chimaka um, and many others, I'm sure, importantly, are doing is looking um, at who is missing from this story um, and trying to write it in. Um, or trying to uh, make sure that it is there. Um, and to say, again, I mean, by admiration to what Maria said, I mean, I think any kind of healthy state of any kind, I mean, it has to be correcting this um, for the future, the things that we got wrong the first time. Um, there's something very compelling about anniversaries where we seem to, um, I don't know, like in 
I think scary movies um, anniversaries are very dangerous, right? You don't go swimming at the lake where 50 years ago three teenagers mm, went. Of course. You don't do it. Um, because these anniversaries, you know, they open up portals, they do things, they allow us um, these sort of rare moments of energy to kind of correct things in certain ways. Um, which is not to say that the work um, isn't ongoing by archivists and writers and academics all the time. But there's something about these anniversaries that allows people um, a different kind of energy to think about that record, to have something approaching a, nat a national conversation about it. Um, and I think at those moments, yes, you can um, use poetry, literature, writing um, to think about those narratives, to think what's um, in an accepted form um, of history. Um, and that's, that's part of the, the problem of the nowness. I mean, history is a... Um, I don't want to make, again, too many generalisations, um, nor talk with any authority about the work that historians do, um, because it's, it's different, I guess, than what I do. Um, but, I mean, history happens in the present. I mean, we, we know that. I mean, that's when it's happening. That's when we talk about things. That's when we narrativize things. That's when we um, have those conversations. Um, so I do think that at these moments of anniversary, um, of, or significant anniversary, or significant recollection, um, yes, it can. It can do important things. It can do important work. Yeah, I guess because anniversaries are kind of a mix of retrospection and and kind of looking forward, right? Like that's kind of what you're doing in, a, in an anniversary. And I'm even reminded by I, one of my poems in the Radical book, I think says something like, sometimes the start of the dream is, is really the middle because you don't really know where you are when you're kind of in that moment of now, which we kind of keep on coming back to. Um, one of the things, you know, we've talked about being in the archive and the kind of immense amount of material that can be there. And, you know, um, you can kind of, end up examining a lot of material before you get to the point of finding the thing that you know you think you're going to write about and you know for me it, it came with a lot of ideas a lot of materials and far more than I could ever fit even in the 10 poems that I wrote and I was just wondering did you kind of gather other things that are still in your mind to write about or that you have written about or was it kind of uh, you, you found the image and that's kind of contained within the poem? I think, for the, except for my first kind of visit to, to Prony for a couple of days, um, I was sort of collecting things. Um, I, was, I was trying to find these interesting conversations. But I suppose what seemed to be collected there, um, I guess it, it wasn't really serving the purpose that I wanted. Um, I did not necessarily want to read things um, that corroborated my understanding um, of, of the record. Um, I didn't necessarily need that uh, so much. So I found, I found a lot of newspaper clippings, a lot of letters from sons writing to their mothers back home, um, you know, in America and Canada, um, saying what's going on there. Uh, and that's because those are kind of interesting first-hand records. Um, but nothing really that thrilled me um, in that sense. Um, but I think the wider experience of thinking about it um, is is really important, and, and um, yeah, practicing that that um, instinct because it's not really composition. I, I don't in, in the same way that I would usually work, and I don't want to use too many cliches. But you, you know that, that idea that some of the arts, um, painting or maybe poetry um, or whatever, um, they are arts of addition, where you, you start with a blank canvas and you add to it and you create an image that way. Um, and the sculpture, on the other hand, you start with the block of marble and you remove until you get to the image you're looking for. Um, the art is something similar, where you're confronted with this um, massive amount of stuff and you're looking for the one thing in it that will interest you. Um, so that as an experience um, is very interesting. Um, you know, it exercises your patience in a different way. So you can't hurry it, you can't make it happen. Um, no amount of you know, sleeping better or eating food or exercising is really going to help you find this. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, practicing that instinct is, is very useful, um, even if, I don't think there are other sort of texts or scraps of material that I can think of at the moment. Yeah, I think Sean Hewitt and I talked at one point about, because uh, he was working in the archive as well, while I was in the National Library, and um, we talked about how we kind of end up with our own archives of the archives, like these things that we've collected from the projects, that, so in a sense then you have this whole other, like maybe each of us have this whole other um, mass of material that we've collected and selected, so we kind of become these weird collectors in, in a strange way. Um, and, you know, the Poetry as Commemoration Project has, you know, one of the great things about it is it's so far-reaching in terms of how the poems are presented. You know, you've got the jukebox, we have readings like this, there's the website, there's the Irish Poetry Reading Archives, so there's lots of different ways to 
interact and see the poems. And I noticed that you've made a film of your poem with Pecan Productions that has kind of a soundscape, and you have filmed poem for the, the poem for the Poetry Reading Archive. And so I'm wondering, you know, what do you think that kind of visual element or the kind of performative element brings to the poem? Um, what your experience of doing that was like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, it was, we filmed it in not too long, a couple of hours, I think, um, which is very interesting. And I mean this in the most um, respectful way possible. It's not a film that I necessarily have to watch. So what is in it? I have, a, I have an idea because I've, I've looked at it. Um, I've looked at it moving. But, you know, we don't want to hear your own voice on tape. So um, it's, it's challenging in, in that way. Um, but it looks glorious and I like how it looks. Um, and it's a, a pleasure to do. Um, one of the things that was interesting about about the experience of doing that is choosing what to excerpt from this because this is, you know, as I said, this is quite a dense poem and my, my loyalty there was to try and make the language function um, with the object that I picked. Uh, so I wasn't thinking of a sweet lyrical line that could be taken out of context mm -hmm. that, um, that, that could be used. Um, so I think what I often did um, for the purposes of, of that was to uh, read the start of the poem, sort of offer this context in which this is happening. Um, and again, yeah, kind of, um, kind of dense language. So it's strange to read these bits over and over again, um, and stranger still to memorize them. Um, mm. You know, to try and not rustle paper next to the microphone to, um, yeah, to perform it, I guess, so to speak. Do you ever great. memorize the one? Not things I've read. No, I don't really um, know, but I find it amazing. Like if you see Martin Evans read, she mm. always reads from memory, and it's really striking. And I always think I should do it, but it's really hard to do. It's great if you're, um, you know. Sitting through something you'd rather not be sitting through. If you have a little jukebox in your head, you can <laughs> 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 um, well, I just have a couple more questions before we'll hear some more poems from you. Um, and I think you know a lot of what we talked about tonight is these kind of gaps in the archive. And um, Bibi Ashley and I spoke about you know her poem kind of came out of this research in the archive around the Irish book lover in this particular period of time where where issues were missing. Um, and of course, like Chiamaka talked about um, women's roles and women being kind of missing from uh, the historicization of this period, which is also what I've written about. And, you know, I think that really in your poem, as you've talked about it, you're, you're describing a kind of um, sacrifice or unintended loss. And I guess in this whole kind of project of the decade of centenaries, which is, you know, it's a, it's a large thing to be involved in, um, I wondered, was there anything in general that you would have liked to see more or less of in that kind of project of commemoration? It's a great question. Um, I suppose that its, it's purpose really is to, is to, is to do that. Um, what would I like to see more or less of? I mean, I think there are things that are implicitly important to that project that needn't necessarily be a part of it. And again, it's thinking, um, but, you know, what is it that will be what will the 150th anniversary look like? What will, you know, what, I, I, you know, well, many of us weren't here um, for, say, the 50th. Uh, many, you know, many of us were, but um, what will it look like again as this, this, sort of, this kind of evolves? This project then becomes part of that memory, um, which is an interesting thing. Um, so I think those things are extremely important. Um, I, don't, I don't sense much that was missing from it, because I think it seems to have been quite wide-ranging um, and substantial, and an awful lot of work has gone into it um, to, to make it so, um, and its visibility, I think, has been really significant. Um, but no, I mean, it's been, a, it's been a real pleasure to be involved in it and to think about it, and yeah, I mean, I, I noticed it happening, I don't know, it's, it's one of those interesting things about when this starts, because I remember thinking about it um, in April 2012, when we started thinking about the Titanic. Um, and for me, that, that sort of became, you know, because that's one of the, the things that I knew was happening then, because I had seen the hit motion picture. Um, and sort of thinking, like, what, and living in Belfast, and, and thinking about that, how do we, that seemed like a trial run um, in some ways, like, how do we remember this? Um, are, what are we celebrating? Are we remembering? What is the word that we, we use here? Um, and then, you, you know, then it starts properly, um, I guess. Um, and then you get to 1916. Again, I remember 1916 when there was an idea of what are, you know, we were commemorating something, but living in the North, um, people are commemorating usually one of two things, um, the Battle of the Somme or the Easter Rising. It seemed like there were a few people who could celebrate uh, both of these things. Um, so I became very aware, I guess, um, of this upcoming decade, um, but it's impossible to separate this decade from all the others. Um, it's impossible to separate, you know, this year from next year um, in, in the way that I 
kind of, I felt very guilty and very naive when I sort of think of the Spanish flu and I think of, oh yeah, 1918. And as we know, it's mad to think that the things like that are contained to a year. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't stop thinking about that on 31st of December 1918, um, in the same way that our lives are still marked by, by the pandemic. Um, I just think, you know, this, this will spill over the, you know, over the calendars in, in all kinds of ways. The events of 100 years ago, they weren't confined to those years. They weren't just dramatic moments that stopped. Um, they have their own little futures. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just made me think so much about, um, about all of this stuff, about um, this decade that doesn't really end, even if Catherine's bit ends. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because things are not kind of like neatly defined in that way, even though the kind of decade of centenaries is neatly defined, but just when you bring up the Spanish flu there, like that kind of um, worked its way into what I was thinking about because I live right beside James's Hospital in Dublin, which was a real site for um, treating people during Spanish flu. And then we were, you know, in this really strict lockdown while I was starting to make this work. And so you can just kind of see how these um, kind of time that we maybe understand as a particular period then seeps into your present in, in, in these ways that just, you know, that things are connected in ways that maybe you don't expect and things are not so easy. And in the memory of the people who, you know, involved, you know, ended up in the Civil War, I mean, they, they weren't just acting from then onwards, they didn't just, you know, come to life. Um, I mean, it was in their memory of what had just happened. I mean, in the same way that the First World War was, the same way the Rising was. Um, yeah, just thinking about all of the sort of porousness of all those years as they sort of fall together, that seems like an important um, thing to think about. Yeah, really important. I like that chorus, and so it's really nice. Um, so I'm just going to finish up with this last question. Um, we're going to hear more poems from Stephen. Um, it's been really nice to talk to you like this. Um, and, you know, I kind of just want to finish by talking about your practice a little bit more generally beyond this kind of project of commemoration. Um, as Catherine mentioned, your most recent collection, Ch Cheryl's Destinies, kind of travels back and forth through time, and your first collection, If All the World Were Love and Young, explore, explores grief and loss through Super Mario World, and I'm sure many people have read both books. Um, so maybe you can just finish by telling us um, a little bit about kind of what you're working on now and what's happening in your practice. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's mysterious. I think one of the things that I keep writing about, um, what I've been trying to work out, um, over the, over the last little while, I'm not going to work it out, but I'm thinking about it. Um, I think the last book I did was big parts of it were written during the, the lockdown, and it wasn't about that because I think that's kind of tedious as a subject. I mean, that's one of those things that's that's so um, was so massively globally experienced that it's not interesting. Like you think it's interesting, but it's not interesting um, to anyone else who was living through it. Like, yeah, you baked bread, did you? <laughs> um, you know, that's not interesting. Um, so I'm trying to think of like what that did to time, like what you know the, the sense that, and again, you know, living through a period of 100 years and the sort of hauntedness of that, of feeling like, what am I, what memory am I disturbing by doing this on the day, 100 years ago, since this happened and all that. Um, but I suppose what I found myself thinking a lot about, um, yeah, it's, it's some kind of, uh, again, don't know how to get there, but some kind of westernness. I'm trying to work out what that, what that really means, I mean, to live sort of on, on the west of Europe, um, to be in a kind of western, a sort of Western culture, and I guess what that means is, um, or what I'm using it to mean, I guess, is, is sort of in language. Like, what is this Western, what's all the things that are happening in our language and through it and, um, and all this stuff, just what is it to, to be doing that? Um, and to be trying to think, um, yeah, but, but all the, the sort of things that happen uh, to us as, as Western people, um, and people who watch Westerns, which is, I guess, the other thing. Um, but, yeah, I guess that's what I've been thinking about. And I think a lot of things that are sort of daily religious or trying to, not, not in a necessarily religious way, but, um, I mean, for instance, I'm trying to think of, um, yeah, some, some sense of uh, futurity, some sense of, um, I guess, some, some Christian myths, um, and how they are tied to our sort of global world structures in some ways, I mean, the, the, by which I mean, um, you know, a phenomenon like capitalism is an ideology that sort of says like suffering's not really important because the ends justifies the means. Um, and just thinking about how our societies, and um, particularly in this kind of Presbyterian, uh, Protestant kind of way, uh, map onto that. You know, that suffering in the short term is worthwhile because at the end there is a reward. Um, and that's possibly deeply offensive to to people. But yeah, thinking about those two things together, about um, the sort of westernness and uh, its 
entanglement um, religiously and um, capitalistically, I guess. I know it doesn't sound very interesting. No, I'm, 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 I'm very interested. I can't wait to read it. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Thank you all for listening. We're going to hear more from Stephen, and then we'll be wrapping up for the evening. So thank you just to Joni and Brendan.